I think this is such an important and interesting topic to discuss and it, it, for many reasons. Uh, it, it highlights a few things that I want to point out. One is um, systemness, that we can look at clinical practice and variation and work together across all of our markets, our divisions, and come together and agree on a standard. And, and we will, as an entire health system, translate and transfer over to this new standard. So we are on that road to creating both sort of systemness and standards. And, and I think that's just really important. I think the other thing that this discussion highlights is some of the efforts we're doing around equity and diversity um, across the entire health system. And, and the final third point I think is it also highlights that we have amazing pockets of expertise throughout our health system, both in our local communities, at our academic centers, and pulling them together and coming together and figuring out what the best practice is and what the best evidence is, uh, is something you know, we need to do just more and more of. So enough of that, let me, let me introduce our speakers today. We have Dr. Dr. Uh, Dr. Raghuram, who's a nephrologist at Franciscan Medical Group in Tacoma. Uh, he did his residency in internal medicine and as a clinical research fellowship in nephrology at the University of Minnesota. And he uh, serves as a nephrology um, subspecialty teaching faculty at Virginia Mason at the internal medicine residency program there. We have Dr. Bashar, who is uh, the division chief of nephrology and associate director for renal services at Creighton University School of Medicine and CHI Nephrology. He is, interestingly enough, board certified in internal medicine nephrology and what's I, I, he and I love to talk about is his interest in critical care and fluid and electrolyte disorders. Um, so, and he has spoken to us in the past and so look forward to hearing his thoughts. And finally, we have Dr. Ankara Sagar, who is a board certified primary care internist and academic physician um, and leader in healthcare management and delivery. Uh, she joined us just a little while ago to really help us think about systemness and practice variation and she's been leading a lot of the efforts in that space. So I'm excited to both uh, hear from her and introduce her to everybody here. So I will turn it over, Dr. Ron, go, take it away. I appreciate uh, this opportunity. This is uh, close to my heart and having experienced a variety of uh, different phases of uh, uh, evolution as we went along in our medical school years and into the higher uh, echelons into the academic centers, we never personally questioned the role of race in medical school. As in an academic setting, uh, we reviewed articles, we criticized articles, we, we never really questioned the role of race in real function estimation. And we, I taught my medical students, I taught my fellows uh, the evolution of EGFR um, based on some inadequate data. And we are going to explore that a little bit, we're going to give you a little bit of a background and then enter into the realm of how the National Kidney Foundation and the ASM came together um, in two very large organizations uh, to focus on one task. How can we get, get a better equitable system uh, when we think about uh, estimating a GFR and how can we improve on the existing processes implement the changes, make sure that the implementation does not cause more trouble than what it already has. So we call this the fuel gauge of our uh, GFR system. You can see uh, everybody is reaching forward, not for anything else, but for equity and uh, some empathy in their underlying disease process. And uh, you wanna be in the green zone, and not on the red zone, but you can see there are several colors here, not necessarily black, a variety of shades of brown and white. So this is uh, going to show the point that I think we are here to provide equity finally uh, to a large group of minorities underrepresented um, to give them a better chance in getting what they deserve. So this uh, story starts with medical students in University of Washington. So this happened in 2019, and Bessie Young, uh, the uh, associate professor, gave me the slide. Uh, this is officially published in uh, the 
Circle 360 journal from, uh, J, uh, from American Society of Nephrology. And the questions asked by the medical students are quite intriguing. So uh, one of them said, it does not make sense to assume that black people have more muscle mass. How do we know that? How can you measure muscle mass in a living person? So does it essentially mean that the black people have to get sicker to even qualify from some of the treatments compared to the white people? This doesn't make sense. And then this is a very interesting one. In the transplant patients, when a white person gets a kidney from a black person, does the kidney now become white and no longer needing race adjustments to manage functioning? Very interesting uh, thought process. And then this is an interesting one. Uh, so if you want to take a look at the race, what about the mixed race people? A large proportion, 13% of the population is a mixed race. And so, so far in medical school, we have been taught that precision and evidence matters. If that is the case, why are we making so many clinical decisions on big projects, which has impact on patient care on imprecise proxy? That's what this was, an imprecise proxy. And this opened up a, a, a Pandora box and you could not shut it after that. Um, and the, the ball which has started to roll and actually the drum roll came from University of Washington, then went to Vanderbilt and all of them were actually promoted by uh, residents as well as uh, fellow students who did not want a non-functioning uh, archaic system to be taught to their future gener generations. And a beautiful article uh, written by the medical student there, uh, this was in 2019, um, Elenia, uh, and subsequently who is now an associate professor at Vanderbilt, uh, highlights this point. So the first official usage of a GFR calculation was the MBRD, published in 1999. It's the most common method that was in use for over uh, 15 years using creatinine, using age, sex, and race. And uh, the only thing that is different here is that uh, the black ones have the arrow going up, which is the green arrow, and everything else was all down. Female, lower GFR, age, lower GFR. And so this study population, dominantly white, male, 40% female, with about 12% black. And this was considered a huge difference compared to what we were doing before collecting 24 hour urine. So when you compared the MDRD, the next big leap came in 2009 with the CKD EPI equation and subsequently has been the most widely used formula. The benefits included having a larger, more diverse study cohort for training and internal validation groups. Races other than first time, other than black or white were represented, even though it formed a small proportion at 6%. The external validation group was less diverse, 10% black and 87% white. So the, 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 the article that was uh, highlighting the differences between the two mentioned that the race coefficient in MDRE and CKD EPI equations presumably was correcting for some other poorly categorized factor. It's a very important line for you to remember, something other than a poorly categorized factor. So this is a social construct, not a biological concept. The introduction of race in the equation, and again, the equation is as good as the, fee, the input that we put into it. And after the landmark study, we went back and looked at the data recently and the recent publication, this is 2021, is based on three articles, article one, article two, and article three, not go into details of it. These are all based on empirical uh, cohorts and anecdotal information saying that black patients have average serum creatinine kinase levels, which are elevated. How does that matter? And here are some of the other studies. So these were the main things that we were basing that introduction of race into the equation was. Remember MDRD was an equation that was brought in uh, from the reduction of protein as a dietary modification 
to reduce the progression of kidney disease. And this equation was transformed from there. Um, muscle mass, as you know, cannot be measured except in the cadaver. Genomic studies, no biological differences in the races. And the possible differences in the creatinine could be ancestral. And now we know uh, APOL1 makes, may, may be that missing link here. And for a lot of research is going into it. Enzymatic as well as transportation process, including a vegetarian like me, and uh, the, uh, medications, including trimethoprim and others, could make a difference in the creatinine. So um, this has a huge impact in, uh, in uh, nephrology care because it uh, confirms the kidney function uh, on the kidney donation area and uh, improves on the dosing medications. It impacts severely on what kind of uh, enrollment in clinical trials you bring in patient to. And choosing the right imaging studies, including MRI and CT, it creates a, an avenue for referral to the nephrologist and uh, when to educate, when to place an access, and when to plan for analysis, and when to start the conversation for initiation of transplantation, all of this has a direct impact. So we started this process. This has been started over um, several years ago in 2009, looking at the 2009 equation, uh, what is the development data set, validation data set, and improving it to 2012 with six new studies and validation into five further studies down the road. And finally, in 2021, where the introduction of creatinine cystatin C equations came in, we had a further data set of validation of uh, 12 further studies, a total number of 4,050. So this is an accumulating evidence with further validation. So this didn't come about uh, in a matter of four months. A lot of work behind the scenes has happened over the last decade. So these are the equations that were looked at, variety of them over a period of time. And we talked about uh, the validation of 2011 e equation and the percentage of black in all those equations varies on an average of between 0% to 32%. Uh, so the biggest representation was the 2009 EPI equation. So <clears throat> this is from a fellow of mine who actually wanted to pictorially represent what happens when you make the changes um, before and after uh, the removal of the race? So we have white and black, creatinine level of 2.8 and 2.8, exactly matched, 55 year old on both sides. And you look at the big picture, you'll see that the GFR uh, of the black patient is at 23 and white patient is 20. So this person gets referred to a transplant and initiates a process for renal replacement therapy. This is uh, after the change, when you remove the race and look at the equation, and what is the impact of the de-indexed equation? You see the GFR has dropped down from uh, 62 to 56, that is below the cutoff of uh, renal disease uh, evaluation. And now you can see over uh, 1.2 million more uh, black patients would be knocking on doors of chronic kidney disease by definition. So the Jason brought this uh, information to the front and they looked at the NHANES as well as the VA database and estimated the GFR with race adjustments and without race adjustments. So here are uh, the differences. When you remove the race in the equation, you double the black population's CKD load and you would actually change the stage three to stage four from blue to red with race adjustments, without race adjustments, and it's a significant impact on drug inspection prescriptions, as well as kidney failure risk equation. When you look at this, I was gratified to see that they did not adversely affect the accuracy of kidney failure risk prediction, and we use a tool for that. So um, I, I will pass through these slides just to show you that there are a variety of different specialties which have been involved here, uh, where the race factor does go into play, including a three tricks, so urology, uh, cardiology, cardiothoracic. These are all scoring systems. And uh, you know, I actually went and looked at and asked many of my colleagues here, that some of them use, some of them don't. And so it's not a widely used risk stratification tool for selection of cases. 
but it still shows that race is an active participant in the selection process. Uh, the task force was set up by National Kidney Foundation and the ASN, and this was charged with examining the inclusion of race. So we, we were tasked with the consideration of broad implications of any change and basing the recommendations on science only and to bring in patients and public together in a consorted way. So these were the uh, activities that were set up in three different phases. So we were supposed to clarify the problem and evidence. I participated in that. Uh, we have to evaluate the approaches and look at alternative approaches and then provide recommendations followed by education of our patients and our colleagues. And to leave one, one important data that uh, new equation approximately one in six patients have a reported EGFR that differs by greater than 30% from the corresponding measured value. So keep that in mind as Dr. Bashir will talk to you about the implications of implementation. So I leave this uh, slide very important. This is the consensus of uh, 26 different approaches from the uh, National Kidney Foundation uh, with task force to try to get a unifying approach here. So this involved experts in provider forum and I participated in the provider forum we looked at the evidence, we looked at the emerging research, and then these boxes identify the specific tasks which are assigned to different parts of the equation. So implementation, including laboratory technicians, biomedical engineers, assay evaluations and standardization, and the final unifying approach includes clinical decision, medical initiation, discontinuation and dosing of medications, and trial eligibility and recruitment, including population tracking. So this was uh, my role in one of the many, many physicians which were participating in this. We had over 40 hours of active discussion and we had uh, maybe 21 different meetings in including nine different countries participating. So it's a wide representation. So this was the final recommendations and uh, the recommendations after the interim report showed that uh, recommend immediate, not phase, immediate implementation of CKD EPI equation uh, without the race variable in all laboratories in the US. And uh, next point, recommend natural efforts to facilitate increased routine, routine, very important there, timely use of cystatin C. And the last one is encourage funding of research. And I want to mention this to you because over uh, $70 billion have been spent by CMS in renal disease. Per patient, renal patient uh, gets $20 spent for research compared to $300 for oncology and $3,000 for AIDS research. So that's why there's a big push there. And uh, so task force, so we actually are now releasing it so that everybody else like our organization can take it further. So uh, I participated in, in, in a format like this, a, many spreadsheets were created, mainly with one intention. So if I make a change, will that affect medical nutrition? Will that impact on vascular access? Will that impact on initiation dialysis, transplantation? And uh, what will be the risk for progression to CKD. And um, so these are the ones which we tabulated individually, every single equation to identify possible harms and possible advantages. So you don't want to create an inadvertent harm to someone with the equation. Three benchmarks were used, and these are very relevant for labs uh, when they are rolling this out. P30 is an important uh, tool agreement within 30% of measured GFR is an important tool for safe use of uh, that uh, equation. This is the app that has been created and it's widely available, uh, both in Android as well as an Apple format. And you can plug in the numbers, discuss that at bedside with the patients and it works. I, I left this equation because this is a very provocative article from Neil Pohl introducing the concept 
occupation, social and economic factors, income and zip codes may make a difference in how risk is managed in the high risk population rather than a GFR. I leave you with this. This slide actually highlights the nine different specific tasks for future research, which uh, the task force has given us. And it's a, a very focused list looking at newer filtration markers. For the current markers, uh, we have to know what the non-GFR determinants of the serum concentrations are. If it is cystatin C that we are using, can we use it in a heterogeneous population? There is data coming use of cystatin C in hospitalized patients. So we, that is a very important next step for cystatin C. And uh, can we apply it across all ethnic groups? And if we do use this, what is the impact on uh, the white population? So all of this actually has been highlighted here the last one I liked it the most is the option eight. What is the effect of using risk-based versus GFR threshold criteria? Very important for, I think it's a better tool to obtaining access to medical benefits, access to care, access to transplantation, nephrology referrals and nutrition services. This will be a game changer. And the reason is, the black population has a higher incidence, 2.9 times higher of a chronic kidney disease and 11 times faster progression of kidney disease to ESRD. So I think base, risk-based evaluation would be a better option. So I stop there and uh, we'll come back later for questions. Thank you for your time. Great, thank you very much. Um... Dr. Bashir. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And uh, thank you, Dr. Raghuram, for, for really a in-depth uh, analysis. And you honestly set the stage so well for me. Um, I'll, I'll focus my, my talk, uh, my presentation on a personal journey. And, and this is honestly, for the last two weeks, I've sort of had to take a trip down the memory lane and essentially come up with my experiences and, and my reflections on this and, and, and the steps we have to go through to just implement a change uh, in, our, uh, in our institutions here. So um, journey to CKD at 2021, that's sort of our destination. Um, why the change? And I think uh, Dr. Raghuram actually set the stage so well, um, and I will maybe not speak much on that. So just, just kind of summarize, just, just take home message. 37 million adults have CKD, 90% not aware. And a lot of those are African-Americans, Latinos, Asian-Americans, Pacific Islanders, and others. 785,000 have advanced kidney disease and they will require dialysis or some sort of renal replacement therapy. 100,000 are on uh, wait list for kidney transplant. So you can imagine just on a snapshot what the healthcare burden is, what we're looking at. So, so again, why the change? And I think this is some of uh, what Dr. Raghuram already said. Uh, we as physicians are, are committed uh, to to make sure that we provide the best of care uh, to people across the, across the spectrum. It's about equity, mainly it's about justice. It's about helping most vulnerable. It's about identification. It's about referrals. It's about diagnosing as well as drug dosing. It will improve care for the late stage kidney disease patients. We're identifying them better and, and therefore we can intervene earlier. It will also provide options and timely renal replacement therapies and ultimately reduce the overall cost. Uh, I, I do believe that that is going to be a, a great consequence that if we intervene in a timely fashion, we have better options in front of us. Uh, this will save overall cost for the healthcare system. So um, we know as physicians uh, what the background is and, and where do we need to go? Well, how do you implement a change? Um, so these are some of the thoughts I just put on the slide in terms of my 
uh, difficulties um, when I went through our institutions here. Uh, countering dogma, overcoming inertia, uh, then there are institutional delays, uh, bylaws and approvals, some technology hurdles, and finally education and messaging. So, so counting dogma. And, and again, um, as Dr. Raghuram uh, basically presented so eloquently, you know, we, a lot of us were trained when there was just the cockford gold equation. Um, and, and a lot of pharmacy still looks at uh, CCG equation. And then we went on and started using MDRD, uh, which was uh, obviously a race-based equation. And then it was, it was uh, for the change to CKD epidemiology collaboration, 2009 and then 2012, and which was uh, essentially uh, uh, endorsed by KDGO. And as a nephrology community, we thought, my goodness, we just landed on an island of truth. This is it, and we knew the pitfalls of uh, cockford gall equation, and, and this is it. So our minds and our practices are very set on CKD, um, epi, and MDRD. So, um, and then obviously we, we as nephrology community, some of the other physicians who were active on it found that this is not the island of truth. We need to go forward. Those are the, those are the issues. Uh, it's, it's, it's not, it's not equitable. Uh, there, is, there is lack of justice to a certain population which is more vulnerable. So what were my difficulties? And you know, I started having conversations, um, some in the private setting and some with um, the leaders of our institution, some opinion leaders, and this is what I heard. Why do we have to change? I, honestly, I don't have time for this. I honestly cannot keep up with the existing workload. And you know, it's already very confused. It's gonna create a lot of confusion. So knowing all this, um, we, we set uh, our eyes on, on building consensus. And, and you know, I have to really give credit to our student body here at Creighton, Creighton University. Um, they were very active. Um, we were um, able to we did numerous meetings uh, in terms of messaging, uh, letters to the editors. Um, and, and finally, we were able to come up with a message uh, which will go to our uh, committees, our system committees, our MECs. You know, one interesting observation I must say is the cultural differences. And I have seen that the institutions or, or the campuses where there's a rapid turnover, more education-based, uh, uh, students and residents were more amenable to change. Um, uh, but there were some other campuses where I had more difficulty and I totally get that. Um, just imagine how hard it's changed. You know, you put your wristwatch from left hand to right hand and, and you know how difficult it causes you doing all that. Anyways, we were able to do that. Um, I was able to take the message to, um, uh, to, to first of all, the system committee and then to MECs. Um, and uh, we were able to overcome the differences and, and build a consensus and finally got that approved. However, that did take us uh, close to three to four months uh, to get to that point. So um, I had parallel con conversations. On the one hand, I was trying to build consensus with the stakeholders. And on the other hand, I was talking to pathology and, and IT people to make sure that when we're ready, uh, the change will be implemented. Um, I was given uh, the answer that that's gonna take a long time. It's really hard. We have to change the equation um, and that will not be possible uh, within a few months time. It may take maybe four to six months. However, that didn't turn out to be a problem. And, and I will let you know in the next few slides why that was the case. So, um, Finally, um, after we were able to get everything approved uh, through the system committees and the MECs, uh, the, I was tasked with uh, uh, this uh, important task, I would say, where you just have to come up with the messaging. How do you message? A lot of people were concerned that, that the, the physicians will get phone calls from the, uh, from the patients. Well, how come my, my GFR changed? you know, in a, in a matter of a few months. 
and 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 there will be a lot of confusion, a lot of uh, um, um, angst about the whole thing. So um, I sat down um, with pathology um, and student bodies and other physicians to to come up with with the right message. The important lessons I learned was that you have to have the right context and background. Uh, you have to be brief and precise. Uh, one quick thing with the student body, I had a, a, a message which was about three pages long and there was, there was a lot of science in it, uh, but there was also a lot of politics in it. Uh, and I sat down with them, I said, look, you know, you really have a winning argument here just on the basis of science. We really don't wanna bring in anything else into it because that will alienate people. So we're just focused on science. It's gotta be brief. We have to have the right context. It has to be clear. And then again, there should be an example. I know we all learn by examples. Uh, we have to put an example there. And then uh, we also have to say, what do you expect and how do you remedy? So with that in mind, so this is a message we came out um, and this went out to our physicians. Uh, so the interesting finding uh, as, as you, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just, just talk about in a second, but just take a look um, that we just are now reporting GFR as a single entity. And we're reporting at our institution GFR as a single entity based on CKD API. Um, we actually made that change in 2015. And I was surprised that we did make a change in 2015. We were using CKD API equations. However, we were still reporting as MDRD. Uh, so this was the problem with IT because they never made the change. We were able to change the equation and we were reporting CKD API. However, the change in the way it's gonna be coming out on, on, on different uh, EPIC or any other EMR system was still MDRD. So that solved my problem. I did not have to involve much um, of the issues with how you're gonna change the equation, how it's gonna be interpreted. So we already had CKD API and all what we need to do was to just uh, cross out the other uh, uh, figure and just report as one entity. I had to put my name there along with uh, the other uh, lab folks. So if anybody has any questions, uh, they can call me. Uh, fortunately, I haven't had very many calls. Uh, the calls have been few and, and they were very well-meaning. So um, I think I'm gonna take just maybe 60 seconds to just point out another uh, observation and another finding I had within our institutions and that really surprised me. Um, we all know about cockford gall equation and the equation is right there in, uh, in front. Uh, you can see that um, it, it has its pitfalls. Uh, there are assumptions that it, the creatinine production, which we use as a marker for, for, for GFR, uh, it decreases with age, um, its production is higher with people with greater weight. The weight could be either a muscle or it could be fat weight. Uh, it requires the multiplication for women and, and 0.85 for women on the assumption of smaller muscle mass. And then it does not account for body surface area and, and it's not uh, ready for the newer uh, standardized materials we're using these days. So it may overestimate. So we knew that. So I was surprised that our pharmacy still uses Cockford Galt. So, you know, we as nephrology community felt, my goodness, we landed on the island of truth when we had the MDRD and, and CKD epi. Um, and, 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 and even though it was with the race, we still felt that we had done much better compared to Cockford Galt. However, our pharmacy colleagues still use the, the uh, Cockford Gall equation to dose all of the uh, medications, uh, be it uh, in oncology, uh, be it in, um, in, in dialysis, uh, be it in chronic kidney disease. And they really go by a number which shows on the left side here. If you guys use EPIC, you can relate to this. So we have, it automatically spits it out. So it's highlighted in yellow. Creatinine clearance is 45.2 for a patient for a creatinine of 2.14. Um, so, um, and I actually did send a letter to, to, uh, to our pharmacy colleagues um, and, and the answer I got back was, uh, well, 
this is how we were taught. And, and our textbooks still uh, use the Cochrane Gall equation. And this is what we go by. Uh, sorry, we cannot make a change. And if this bothers you, uh, we can have IT just remove that very yellow uh, portion, and but we'll still continue to use Cochrane Gall. So, so just, just to reiterate that in our system, pharmacy still is using Cockford Gold. On one hand, we as, as, as a nephrology community and, and other physicians are moving towards the, the latest and the best, uh, pharmacy is still using the Cockford Gold. And, and I will not spend time on this. Uh, Dr. Raghuram actually very eloquently explained all that in detail in terms of what NKF ASN task force recommended and why and what the expectations are. Uh, <clears throat> so, so you must have heard from the talk that their, their recommendation was to uh, immediately move towards a CKD epi creatinine equation 2021 and then start looking at down the road incorporating uh, cystatin C uh, as well as using the combined equation. So just a quick one slide in terms of, for lots of you who don't know what cystatin C is, it's a low molecular weight protein um, uh, and it's produced by cells. Uh, it's filtered by the glomerulus. So our filter is glomerulus and it's not reabsorbed. Uh, it is metabolized by the tubules, therefore we cannot use it directly to measure clearance. Uh, I'm sorry, creatinine is, a, is, is an error there. So it should not be used directly to measure clearance. So it is reported as unaffected by age, gender, muscle mass, or diet. However, some of the data is still showing that no, there is some variation with uh, male gender, age, great weight and weight, greater height and weight, uh, higher lean body mass, as well as fat mass, diabetes, and inflammation. And, and again, not be able to use in the, um, in the um, uh, non-acute setting. So, so with that, uh, with that, with that journey in mind, uh, with the information in mind, in the context and the background, where do we stand today? Where are we in terms of our final destination? What kind of steps we're going to have? We're moving towards um, a, a um, our final destination to incorporate cystatin C along with creatinine CKDF equation. Uh, we will be. Um, looking at this equation to provide a better estimate of EGFR across race, gender, and body types. Um, we would like to start a dialogue with pharmacy colleagues to use newer and the better equations because I do believe um, this is an issue um, within our, uh, our institutions. Um, we have, um, um, especially in, in cases of um, um, uh, oncology, and this was brought up by one of our oncologists. Uh, this becomes paramount, especially when they develop chronic kidney disease. We like to have a stepwise approach uh, uh, given the challenges and lessons learned. I have seen that, that it has to be, you have to build consensus um, and, and, and you have to overcome culture. You know, my favorite quotation is that, that culture eats strategy for lunch every day. Uh, so, so you have to take your time, but I do believe that at the end of the day, all of us want to do the right thing for our patients and for our populations. Um, and as, as we provide them with the right set of education, they are willing to jump on ship with you. Uh, and that's all I have to say. This is my final slide. Thank you so much. And I really want to take a minute to, uh, to thank you Dr. Sagar for, for helping me out with this. Um, she was an immense support. Hey, Dr. Sagar. Thanks, Dr. Greenfield and Dr. Bashir. Um, pleasure to speak to everybody this morning regarding what it will look like once we are transitioning and what this process may show. First and foremost, a big thank you to many people across Common Spirit who've helped us get to this point and especially to our colleagues in the laboratories and pathology uh, for really partnering and at times leading this change and IT. So thank you very much. Uh, it cannot be stressed enough how much your partnership means to us. 
So uh, just a few slides on what is clinical standards and variation reduction. So our team is really thinking about how do we bring the best care possible, use evidence-based medicine and collaboration and consensus building across common spirit. And we are going to be identifying high priority clinical areas, formulating that consensus of what we consider a common spirit standard of care and leveraging our partnerships and opportunities with clinical institutes and markets to make adoption and adaptation to that standard a reality for our patients and communities that we serve. And when we're thinking about standards of care, partnership is really important. And that means partnerships with our teams in quality, academics, our frontline clinicians, our team in population health, because all of us are trying our level best to think about equity as a key lens through which we approach care and evidence-based care moving forward, as has been so eloquently stated by both Dr. Raghuram and Dr. Bashir, this is a place that we want to make sure we keep our minds and hearts open to. NKF, so National Kidney Foundation has given the recommendations. There are three main ones. First and foremost, use the 2021 CKD epi equation. It removes the race adjuster or variable for our patients. Two, let's use the statin C, especially when we are trying to confirm an EGFR when we're making clinical decisions in the non-acute setting. And three, let's get some research to make sure that the changes we're making don't have adverse effects and how or we are capturing the positive outcomes. We are not the first ones to be on this transition. As Dr. Bashir mentioned, Creighton has already taken this on. University of Washington, University of Pittsburgh, UC Davis, UC San Francisco, Penn Medicine, and our lab partners, LabCorp, Quest, and ARUP are well on their way to this transition and should be completing in the coming months. So what is Common Spirit exactly doing? We are adopting and aligning ourselves with the National Kidney Foundation recommendations. So we will be transitioning to the 2021 EPI equation. Again, that's the equation that removes the race as a variable. We also have Sistatin C available for ordering. We want to stress it should be judiciously used in the non-acute setting to confirm the EGFR of a patient that we suspect to have chronic kidney disease. And we will be working on the transition in the, for the EGFR to be reported, including the cystatin C in the equation. What this looks like is basically we've, we've created a packet and we know brevity is of the essence. So we do have a one page summary. So that takes one minute to read. Uh, if you are short on time, as I find myself sometimes, um, but also we have the option of going deeper into the details based on the section that you would like to address, but we will abbreviate those findings for you today. What should you know? You do not have to order the EGFR differently. Let me say that again. You do not have to order your EGFR differently. You will order it just the way that you've ordered it before. On the back end, labs and IT will work together to reflect the EGFR back to you in the electronic medical record with the new equation. So statin C testing is available as a lab test, so you can order that. But the transition for both of these equations will occur in phases. What does that mean? So the 2021 EGFR that does not use statin C in its equation, but removes the race will occur in the coming 90 days. The statin C equation will occur 90 days after that. So we're hoping within a six month timeline, we will have transitioned both the equations, whether you're ordering a creatinine based one or you're ordering a cystatin C based. So I'm a primary care doc, as many of you guys are. I would love to see what it looks like. What am I reading? So this is exactly what you're going to be seeing on your labs. You're gonna see as of date, X, Y, and Z, meaning as of April 22nd, our labs locally have transitioned over to the new equation. So you will be informed when you're looking at your lab report. 
if you see a patient whose EGFR is between 45 to 59, you will also see a comment recommending consideration of cystatin C in the outpatient setting to confirm the EGFR is a true reflection of that patient's disease state. What we need to do as next steps, we need all of us to build awareness and share our knowledge amongst our peers. We will be hosting multiple town hall meetings. Next one coming up is next week. So we hope to see many of you there. We will be sharing the link for the clinical information kit, the choose your own adventure one that I mentioned. So if you have one minute, you can read the executive summary. You want more details and you can choose the section you would like to go to. It is also available on the Physician Resource Library, which has a lot of great stuff on there. So I encourage everybody to share that. And if you would like to read the CKD guidelines and how to diagnose CKD and update your skills on it, we are gonna share this slide set with you also with the links. More importantly, we need you to counsel, review and consider. Counsel our patients. So some of our patients may find themselves with slightly worsening kidney function as a surprise. The National Kidney Foundation has excellent patient-facing information. I encourage you to have it readily available in your office in the event you want to share it with your patients. Please review and adjust medication dosing. We do not expect majority of the patients will need adjustment in medications, but you may find that some patients need some medication adjustment based on the new EGFR. And lastly, consider referral. So if your patients are showing a significant lowering of EGFR, talk to them, consider referral with nephrology and other folks to understand the best strategies for mitigating progression of kidney disease and planning next steps. Again, resources, we are going to be sharing all of this. Uh, you'll be getting a bulletin by email. This is on the Physician Resource Library. We have a previous grand rounds as well as this one that's going to be posted to that as well. And we have town halls coming up. I guess I will leave you with this, that a journey of a thousand miles must begin with a single step. So this is our first step towards equity and I'm very proud to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a very, very thorough and fascinating history of of GFR and, and how we got to where we are. So thank you. I really appreciate that. I, I guess I'll open up the questions. Gary, do you have a question or Ankara? I, I have one. Um, the audience. Uh, let's see. We do not have any audience questions thus far. And I would just also thank everybody for a great conversation and very thorough. And I think it does set the stage well. The, the one question that I have is, and people have asked me, well, how are we going to measure this? How are we going to know if we've succeeded? And I've said, well, we're going to succeed because all of the all, all of the equations are going to change. But but one question I do have is, is there a way for us to know, like if the number of referrals for end-stage kidney disease management, people on transplant lists, people who end up on dialysis earlier, is there a way for us to judge the sort of movement of the equation? Uh, that that lets more people in that door, and can we measure that across the system? This tool is actually designed to do that, and so we are. When you take the first step, you are tracking the outcomes. Uh, so the data is there. There is good publication validation that it, the change that you make in the equation does not increase your risk for going into ESRD per se. This is a tool for people to be further evaluated for renal right. radiation therapy and other things to provide some equitable care, which uh, black patients have been denied thus far. So we are just leveling the playing field. But you bring up a good point that these tools are designed specifically for that. I mean, I mean I, a couple of, I mean, one is a kind of a comment. I think the questions are going to be how much, you know, as a primary care, I'm a general internist, um, but the son of a nephrologist. Uh, so I do understand uh, GFR probably more than most. Um, but the bottom line is the vast majority of physicians ordering, uh, you know, these tests are not, they're, they, they're very, you know, we're just gonna look at the result and try to look at the parameters and try to make decisions. 
And so I think as we go through this process of educating people on this change, it's, um, you know, that to me, that's the real trick. And, and the question is, you know, less is more in some ways. It's sort of like, okay, this changed, you know, this is why we did it. And, um, you know, the, the, the education on this is, is going to be tricky. Um, and, and I think the question, and I saw Ankara is working on that um, and the messaging on this and how we keep, keep it simple in a sense is, is probably the, the, the word of the day. Um, and so any general thoughts about that in terms of, I know Ankara, you've been working on this from that, from a messaging standpoint, any comments? Absolutely. I think you've nailed it very well that we want to be brief and we want to be very clear in our messaging. We've been working very closely with our nephrologists right here, but also in other markets and also our primary care clinicians. And I want to include our physicians and APPs in this. And your hosp the us, hospitalists, hospitalists yep. are looking at these all day. Exactly. It might be worth, you know, testing their understanding and doing it in a more interactive way and say, hey, mm -hmm. you know, what do you think of this? You know, you know, patient X had this result. Now they have this result. Um, you know, I think and some it, sort of interactive conversations would be interesting. I think the next phase of this dialogue is how do we approach evidence-based medicine when we think about managing CKD, but really in that stage two, stage three, where they're not getting to nephrology, but we have the tools to prevent progression, whether that's by medications or non-medication-based therapies. Yeah. Well, I think that, you know, that was my second question was take advantage of this opportunity of highlighting this conversation to better engage our referral base so that we engage with nephrologists more to help reduce the pace of end-stage renal disease. And I think we'll have the opportunity in the town halls in particular to have more of that sort of dialogue and, and Tom mm -hmm. that you've described as well. So well, I see this as an amazing um, opportunity for our nephrology colleagues to, you know, to have more engagement with our hospitalists and our primary care providers and every, every specialty, frankly. I know there was um, a recent publication in the annals using KFRE and comparing it and ACR. Um, I, I, I know that would, it's a whole nother discussion, I think, but um, seems like a, the right way to go actually. And it's a, and again, that's why I mentioned this. So when I participated in the National Kidney Foundation the Task Force, the risk-based uh, evaluation mm -hmm. is a better tool than uh, just a GFR has been a gold standard. We have uh, clear data looking at mortality, progression, chronic kidney disease, uh, outcomes from heart, heart failure, variety of things, but it's become so ingrained. So it'll take a little bit of time for the other subspecialties to fall into place because they will feel the pinch. Mm -hmm. so I think well, should... I think that we're uh, hitting our timeline here, Gary. I think yeah, no, an amazing I... discussion. A lot of chat in the box about, hey, we need to hear the hospitalists hear this. We need to have primary care. So I know we're going to be hitting the road a lot on this conversation. Yes. And, and I can't uh, thank everybody enough for your thoughtfulness in this space and how lucky we are to have, you know, all of your expertise, you know, in nephrology and, and Dr. Sargar in just dissemination and implementation. And it's just a great teamwork. I appreciate this so much. Gary, you want to close this up? Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. And I just want to make two comments. One is I think the pharmacy one is a good one. <clears throat> Excuse me. And the second is I really appreciate your mentioning the jugs that we used to not a lot of people remember those jugs, but I do the 24 hour urines. And I, I always think fondly of to carry those around. how to do that. So I appreciate it. Um, and, and just to say, uh, there are some comments in the chat about how can we get this in front of our medical staffs. And if, if you'll reach out to Dr. Sagar and I will, will um, happy to happy to work with you to make that happen. Thank you everybody. Uh, Dr. Bashir, Dr. Raghuram, uh, Dr. Sagar, um, Brooke, John, uh, Tom, appreciate it and uh, have a great day, great weekend, be safe and we appreciate it.